1985, when I was working for Christie's, a major highlight for me was cataloguing a sale of spectacular prints from the collection of Chatsworth House. This exciting sale was packed full of printmaking gems, iconic images by Dürer, a Rembrandt etching that sold for half a million pounds, and yet the one that really leapt off the page for me was this one by the 17th century Italian artist Giovanni Benedetto Castiglione. It's just so bold and daring, dramatic, ahead of its time. Yet the extraordinary thing is that until that point, I had really never come across Castiglione. And even today, I'm sure there are many people who've never really heard of him. Since then, I've been working with prints and drawings for almost 30 years, but I've always held a secret fascination for Castiglione. How could someone so brilliant have remained hidden for so long? So you can imagine how pleased I am that he is now having his first major UK exhibition in the Queen's Gallery at Buckingham Palace. Castiglione was a master of his art, a rival to Rembrandt as the printmaker of the time. But he was also a revolutionary, technically innovative, with a fluid, spontaneous style. And he invented a new printing technique that has influenced generations of artists right up until today. So why did this talented artist never become one of the great names of the Italian Baroque? New research dug out of archives in Italy reveals a turbulent life story involving a long line of criminal acts, from assault to murder. So here at last is my opportunity to find out more about this clearly gifted man who exploded onto the art world of 17th century Italy and then vanished almost without trace until now. With exclusive access behind the scenes of the exhibition, I'll explore his extraordinary work, new discoveries by conservators, and the printmaking process he invented to understand the question at the heart of Castiglione's enigmatic life story. Is it our fault that he's been such a genius lost to us? Or his? has the largest and finest collection of Castiglione's prints and drawings in the world, normally kept here at Windsor Castle. Bought by King George III over 250 years ago, catalogued for the first time in the 1950s, many haven't seen the light of day for hundreds of years. They are stored in a special library that only the senior curators can access. It's truly a privilege for me to be surrounded by so many of the best. This group of about 250 works on paper by Castiglione has been together since the artist's death. In fact, they formed part of his own personal studio, so it's as close to him as you can get. I often find that people dismiss prints and drawings as being somehow less interesting or less important than paintings, or rank them lower in the pantheon of the visual arts. But for me, there's something so intimate about prints and drawings. These are the artist's thoughts on paper, so it's here that we really begin to understand the workings of the artistic mind. And Castiglione is a perfect example. From these works, I think we'll really get to know him. The curators have let me handpick a few select pieces that will help us get closer to this hot-headed talent. It's so lovely to have an opportunity to look really closely at this one, because it's undoubtedly Castiglione's most audacious etching. He's called it the genius of Castiglione, and there it is, right in the centre of the print. 
And it's not necessarily a self-portrait, but he has made a reference to the velvet cap and that very showy plume that he was wearing in his self-portrait. And that's a symbol of furia, creative energies and imagination. In fact, the whole print is full of symbols. And what he's done here is he's introduced lots of elements that his erudite audience would have taken great pleasure in decodifying. So you've got the crown of immortality, you've got the palm of victory. The central figure is the personification of fame with his trumpet. Fecundity down here, symbolised by the rabbit and the chickens. And then the artist's creativity here with his palette and his brushes. But what he was really doing, of course, with this etching was saying, here I am, I'm a genius. So who was this self-proclaimed genius? And how did he become such a trailblazing artist and printmaker? Let's go back to the Italian city that helped hone his artistic talents, Genoa. When we think of the artistic capitals of Italy, we think of Venice, Florence, Rome. Genoa doesn't usually make it onto that list. Yet 17th century Genoa was a cosmopolitan melting pot of cultures and communities. Nicknamed La Superba, it was also a city of wealth, where merchants attracted working artists from Italy and abroad to decorate their homes and churches with art. As money and talent flowed into the port, Castiglione would have been exposed to the emerging and established artists of the day and their latest innovations. Van Dyck spent several years in Genoa in the 1620s, and it's quite possible that Castiglione even spent time in his studio. Castiglione began to draw in the typical Genoese way. This was often bucolic scenes with animals, or pastoral and patriarchal journeys. Castiglione in his early days was often dismissed by his peers as a simple animal painter, but as his ambitions grew, he realised that he needed to move to a bigger artistic centre, Rome. He would go on to become somebody who was constantly moving from place to place, and I almost sense that certain restlessness in his drawing style. The beauty of Castiglione's hand was the way the images just flew off his brush. 1630s Rome was a daunting place for an ambitious artist. It was the time of the Counter-Reformation and Pope Urban VIII wanted to bring people back to the Catholic faith through religious art. This competitive artistic period became known as the Italian Baroque. Castiglione was suddenly vying with artistic rivals from Italy and the rest of Europe for fame, fortune and a great prize of religious and royal patronage. Now he had to up his game to survive and stand out. Castiglione was very conscious that he was not as classically schooled as many of his contemporaries, but worked in a very different, less traditional way. He didn't really like life drawing, for example, which was a staple part of much artistic training. He didn't make endless anatomical studies like Leonardo, but tended to draw very freely onto the paper, his limbs suggested with a flourish. And whereas most artists use drawings as preparatory studies for their paintings, Castiglione's were finished works in their own right. So Castiglione was really out on his own with this style. 
as legal documents from this time reveal, he often had a higher profile as a bad boy troublemaker than as an artist. In fact, there's more in the Italian archives about his court appearances than his art commissions. One evening in the spring of 1635, Castiglione joined his fellow artist at a friend's house. It was a customary form of entertainment to put on improvised comedies, gently sending each other up, but this one went too far when the Roman artist Greppi mocked Castiglione, saying that he merely touched upon the profession of painting. Instead of storming out in indignation, Castiglione beat Greppi with his fists and was then accused of trying to shoot him. It's no surprise his biographer, Niccolò Pio, noted that Castiglione was more feared than loved. There's a really shocking manuscript here from the Italian archives, based on a court case against Castiglione, where it describes how he left Rome and fled to Genoa in such a hurry that he forgot to take anything with him. So the witness records how he had to lend Castiglione everything from pots and pans, to laundry, to bed sheets, to various items of clothing, including his underpants. He must have been in a hurry to leave without those. But the accusation was murder. He certainly looks pretty guilty. These documents are really letting you get to know Castiglione's character. The combination of beauty and silence does feed into the page. There's a sense of a tortured mind putting pen to paper, particularly when he began to tackle more complex subject matter, like allegory and mythology. There's perhaps a hint of the darker side of Castiglione's personality in this one, which shows Circe, who's just transformed the companions of Odysseus into animals. And that theme of transformation was quite an important one to Castiglione because it underlines the fragility of human existence. One moment there are soldiers in armour and the next moment they're gone and it's just the armour discarded. And there are a whole lot of animals here. And actually Castiglione's put his own touch on it here, his own sense of humour because he's added the monkey, the tortoise, the rabbit, which is rather lovely, brings him back to his subject matter he's comfortable with. But there's also the scary face here on the left, balancing out the whole composition. And that's really what appeals to me about this one. It's the combination of the beauty and the torment in one image. And it appealed to audiences at the time, too. Despite his volatile personality, Castiglione was becoming a successful artist. He was soon back in Rome, confidently developing his own style. Deep inside the core of Windsor Castle, I've been granted special access to see Castiglione's work in a new way. prints and drawings are kept mounted and protected, but I've come to see some of them in the conservation studio. I still find it really thrilling to get up so close to a beautiful piece of 17th century paper like this. This is Venus and Adonis, and it's a pen and ink drawing with his characteristic jogs in the left here. But what's remarkable to me is the effect he's achieved with just pen and ink, because you can see these crosshatch lines there really suggest the light and shade. But there's something even more special about this sheet. When the conservators were preparing for this exhibition, they discovered on the reverse of the sheet a drawing that hadn't been seen for 250 years. And here it is. It looks like the design for a tomb, perhaps, which does suggest that Castiglione was busy working on many different projects. And it's rather wonderful that we can go on discovering new things about him from these drawings.
what was really revolutionary about Castiglione was that he didn't only draw with pen and ink on paper, but he also drew with a brush and oil on paper, which was really unusual. And look at this sheet, it gets so many techniques in here, the lighter strokes, the drier stroke. It's really painting and drawing merged into one. And this was a really quick technique that was obviously very suited to a quick mind. There was no other artist exploring oil and paper like he was in the 17th century. At this time, Castiglione could be confident of his talent and ambition, but he still didn't have an official court patron, so he needed to keep selling himself to stand out. Prints were a great advert for an artist's work and status, and one of the most influential print publishers in Rome, Rossi, was keen to spread Castiglione's work to his circle of erudite print buyers. By the 17th century, the print trade was flourishing, and one fellow printmaker really caught Castiglione's eye, Rembrandt. Castiglione was hugely inspired by Rembrandt, and was one of the first known artists in Italy to be influenced by him. He was particularly drawn to Rembrandt's use of tenebrism, a tonal effect using dramatic contrasts of light and dark. Castiglione became known as the second Rembrandt of his day, but he didn't stop there. He set himself apart from his rivals, this time with a new invention. Rembrandt was a master of printmaking, but once again, Castiglione worked in a defiantly different way. Etching is a rigorous discipline, and Rembrandt worked at his plates over and over again, creating several different states of each plate. But Castiglione tended to etch his plates all in one go and then just print them. What he really wanted was something that was less methodical but more spontaneous. And this led him to devise his own completely new technique, the monotype. For someone like me who loves prints, it's Castiglione's experimentation and invention of a whole new technique that's so fascinating. It's all about the materials, the paper and the inks, and the artist's skill in using the relationship between the two. So, to see the process in action, I have come to see artist Hugh O'Donoghue, who's currently engaged in making the monotype here at Pauper's Press. Huey's created a design inspired by a horse's skull detail from a Castiglione print. How's it coming along? Rather well, by uh, the things. Uh, very well, thanks. So what is it for you about a monotype that is so appealing? Well, it's a monotype is, is, is unique. It's one-off, it's one impression, so there's, there's kind of risk with that. So it, it comes straight out of what you're it, thinking on it so it's just you, Yeah, you've quickly got to sort, sort of manipulate the ink and you manipulate the ink like you would, like you would handle paint. So how long have you been working on that one, say? Um, probably been working on 20 minutes. Oh, really? <laughs> I see. So it really yeah, is quick. It is. But with a monotype, you've got nothing on the plate other than the ink. The links between the monotype and the painting are very strong and with a painting you get a build-up of, of layers. With the monotype, there's all sorts of things that you can do by sort of, you know, pulling the brush across the surface and the way the brush breaks in parts and you get an uneven line. All of these things provide... Different textures. They, they provide textures and interests. I'm not just thinking, well, this is a horse's skull. Well, yeah, it is a horse's skull, but it's also a, an aluminium plate with ink on it. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the kind of abstract yes, form and shape. Yes, coaxing an image out Absolutely. Of um, and so that, that's, that's part of the process. And when I start, I don't know necessarily what it's going to be like. So there's an element of the unknown and a surprise is there. Is that how That's, it works? That is how it works. And I want fluidity and a, and a natural feel to it. You know, if you drop um, to some of this mixture into the, into the surface, is. this will af again affect how... Um, oh yes, look, I see. It lifts uh, it off. Yeah, it lifts it off. 
you can work back into your image. And this, of course, would have been interesting for Castiglione if he was working, trying to create tenebris yes. obscure effects. Because it's that sort of light and dark. dark. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah. it's not a science. It requires an intuitive um, response to the medium. You've got to feel the medium. Oh, that's a really good way of thinking about it. So you have to be in quite a brave mood in a way to make a mood. <laughs> yes, either that or... Uh, <laughs> reckless. Uh, uh, reckless, yeah. Well, I do lots of reckless. Castiglione's new invention in the 1640s meant that artists could now draw or paint ink straight onto a plate without engraving and simply print a one-off design. There are only 20 known monotypes by Castiglione anywhere in the world. So it's such a privilege for me to be able to be here with three of the finest from the Royal Collection. And what it tells me about Castiglione is that he just loved paper and ink. Because it's a combination of painting and drawing and printmaking. And look, here, he's used it in a positive way. So he's drawn onto a copper plate and printed from that with ink. And then he's done it in reverse, the negative technique, where he's painted over the copper plate with black ink and then scraped out the highlights with a blunt instrument. And in this one here, he's combined the two so that you get the image that's been painted onto the plate and then he's scraped off the highlights and then even added some brushwork and some wash behind to give it real depth. So this was a real coming together of everything he'd worked with before. He was a real pioneer of this technique. We only get one chance at this, don't we? We get one chance, and uh, hopefully we'll get a, a print out of this <laughs> acceptable. Hope so. No pressure. So you have a pretty good idea of how it's going to translate onto paper, do you? Yes, I'd say so, yeah. No, no, usually if it looks okay on the plate, it'll look all right on the paper. Mm. Wonderful! Look at all those different tones. Liquid, yeah. Liquid. Isn't it? This area here, this is typical, absolutely typical monotype filter. Not just Castiglione, but many artists mm. who've used monotype. You get that sense of the sort of tones being fragmented, and the you know the sense of a of a brush um, as opposed to a, a needle mm. or a marker. I mean, it's very fluid and. Uh, um, although it's derived from the Castiglione, it's my own. Yes, <laughs> <is> quite it? right. <laughs> well, for me, one of the things that struck me about Castiglione was how modern he looked. For me, the word would be timeless. I feel that they have a they have a timeless quality to them. That's partly due to the fact that they're very rooted in drawing. They're very fresh, and to our modern eye, they appear not distant, not on a the monotype didn't actually re-emerge until the 19th century with Degas, who refined the effects of spontaneity and light to express the secretive drama of his intimate scenes. And then a long line of modern masters followed, including Gauguin, Picasso, the list carries on up until today. 
monotypes may seem timeless, but it's important to remember that Castiglione invented and experimented with this technique 250 years before the next artists will pick it up. I still find that incredible. He really was ahead of his time. So what went wrong? Why wasn't Castiglione's talent and legacy remembered and recognized? The new recasting of Castiglione's character often comes from legal battles and witness statements. He's constantly in and out of court, moving around Italy, or on the run. By the end of Castiglione's life, even his own lawyer had turned on him, bringing 78 counts against him. Various misdemeanors he's been accused of, including throwing his sister off a roof. And each time he asks, is this a man that can be trusted? Si possa chiamare uomo da bene? By the time he died in 1664 in Mantua, Castiglione's violent personality and constant court battles had denied him official patronage and obscured his artistic brilliance. It would be a long journey for his works to get to where they are today. As an art historian, I'm always really interested in how things literally got to where they are now. So this group of Castiglione's work probably ended up in the collection of the Dukes of Mantua. From here, they were bought by the great Italian connoisseur collector Sagredo, and then, in turn, by the great British collector Joseph Smith, who was consul in Venice in the mid-18th century, and also happened to be Canaletto's art agent. In 1762, King George III bought Joseph Smith's huge personal art collection to decorate his new home, Buckingham House. The Castiglione prints were buried in albums and catalogued as being of no value. But finally, his works were dug out and catalogued by a fellow rogue, the Soviet spy Anthony Blunt, who was surveyor of the King's pictures from the 1940s. And now that his story has been uncovered, perhaps the reputation of this lost genius will be restored. So here I am back in the exhibition, and it's wonderful to see the best collection of Castiglione's works on paper anywhere in the world hung all together in the Queen's Gallery at Buckingham Palace. He's finally getting the recognition he deserves as a master of the Italian Baroque and as the inventor of the monotype. I always think you can get so much out of simply looking at works on paper. And with all we now know about Castiglione's fiery character, it's all the more gratifying to see them hanging here in these elegant galleries. His talent, his trailblazing techniques, his tormented temperament, all rolled into one. I don't think that this genius will be lost for much longer. And there is something rather satisfying about this rogue having made it back to the heart of the establishment in his own way. He certainly thought he was a genius, and I think I'd agree with him. A devilish and unconventional one may be, but that just makes me love him all the more. Coming up this evening with a faith shrouded in controversy and conflict, it can be hard to rise above the politics. BBC4 visits a vibrant cathedral, not afraid to get stuck in. Off to Southwark, next.